Okay. Um, Chris, there's two. Wait, here's one. Is this one? The bigger one. This one works. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I have the pleasure of talking about the cost of fencing, which is everyone's favorite topic. Um, just sort of before I get into the costs, you know, people have to make decisions on their farms about what type of fencing they're going to put up. And, and the reality is on our perimeters, we need permanent fencing. We need a very stable boundary layer. We don't want to be taking it up and down. It's more secure. Um, there's lots of options in permanent fencing, lots of different looks that we can get. Um, the negatives on, on a permanent fencing system, though, is that there's a lot more labor involved in having a permanent fencing system. Um, and it's, once it's there, it's what it is. Um, so when we put in permanent fencing, we want to make sure that we've done our due diligence and we're really confident that we're putting that fence where we want it to stay forever. Temporary fencing, which is something that you're working on here these two days, is a lot more flexible. Um, it's less expensive. It can be removed to be mowed, making it easier to keep that area cleared. Uh, the negatives are animals can get through temporary fences. Th that is the reality is that it is not the most permanent, strong, sustainable fence. Uh, and there is labor requirements in setting up and taking down that fence. So there, there is labor involved in that type of system as well. Sometimes it's more predictable um, and with some redundancy and materials you can put up and take down a number at a time, uh, which is convenient uh, on some operations. Ultimately, if we were to pick the perfect fence, we'd want all of these characteristics in it, right? We'd want it to be very visible so all the animals know where it is. Um, specifically, if we have uh, horses or feeder cattle or something that's a little bit more wild, that visibility is really critical uh, on that fence. Having it tall enough that nothing can get over it, strong and solid, nothing's going through it, hopefully under it. Uh, I'd like for it to be inexpensive. That's a personal preference. I know no one in here has that same preference. Uh, today, it's, it's actually hard to build an inexpensive fence, so that's just the reality. Um, we'd like it to be low maintenance. This, for me, is one of my highest priorities in my fencing, is that I want to be able to maintain a fence as easily as I can and a long lifespan. Uh, for me, if I'm putting up a fence, a permanent fence, I want it to be up there long enough that the next person to build it is not me. It's, it's one of my children who's currently barely able to walk. So that's my goal right now uh, in my fencing. Um, I have internally a bias towards electrified fencing. I like electrified fencing. I have a lot of high tensile fencing on my farm. It's a low cost fencing option. Um, and we had a, a smaller tornado come through our operation in 2018 took down a house and dropped uh, the roof of the house on this fence, uh, this high tensile fence. And what ended up happening is it took out one or two posts. I knocked the posts out of the ground, popped them off, knocked the fence off, let the wires bounce back up because I still had braces on my ends. I put an electric box on and I turned it on that night and my animals were contained until I could deal with them the next day. So it did exactly what I wanted it to do. It worked for me at a time when I needed it to take care of itself so I could deal with other issues. I was handling on the farm. Um, that doesn't mean that it's the perfect fence for all situations and for all people, but I internally have a bias towards it because I see the value in having electrification on a fence. Um, for permanent fencing, there are five types um, that are pretty common here in Kentucky. Wood plank, um, which is an aesthetically pleasing fence, but a very expensive one. Woven wire, which is our traditional boundary fence. A fixed knot high tensile fence, which looks a lot like a woven wire, but is a slightly different design. Smooth high tensile wire, which should be electrified, uh, in my opinion, and barbed wire, which people traditionally think of as the low cost option on the market. But we'll look at the pricing here. You'll see that it's not as cheap as you might think. Um, I did a cost comparison using a Virginia Tech calculator, uh, putting in values. I've done this for about a thousand foot of fence, not about, exactly a thousand foot of fence putting braces on the ends other than the wood plank that doesn't need bracing. Uh, I put my brace posts as uh, six to seven inch posts, eight foot long so that I can get three and a half to four foot in the ground. I put line posts in this design that are seven foot long and four to five inch diameter. Um, and I've done that because I think that's a cost effective fence that would certainly meet and go exceed the NRCS specifications 
Um, but I think for me, this is a fence that I think practically has enough lifespan that I'm willing to justify the cost to put in a permanent fence like this. Three, four posts for me on a line are too short a lifespan. I wouldn't want to have to repair that fence at that time point. So I'm going to push towards a four, five on my uh, line posts and a six, seven on my brace and corner posts. I have labor costs in here at three quarters of an hour for bracing and one and a quarter hours for double bracing, blah, blah, blah. There's a bunch of pricing in here. But essentially, I'm able to put in a labor cost for both myself and a machine with this calculator, which is really nice. So if I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing with a fence, this allows me to do some pricing work and figure out where I think a project's going to land. Uh, wood plank fence uh, is visible. It is strong, um, but it is very expensive. Um, I've chosen a four board plank fence here for my example because inevitably there's always a board down and three boards holds in an animal and two boards doesn't. So I've chosen a four board plank because I think from a practical standpoint that's what I would build if I was to build a plank fence. Um, the cost on this is very high because we have a lot of wood in this fence. We've got 16 foot planks, four of them. Uh, we have posts every eight foot. Um, and that's just a lot of material. None of this accounts for any maintenance or painting these fences. This is just the raw cost to put up uh, a wood plank fence. Um, and even in here, I only have a labor cost of $1,500. Uh, and that assumes that it's the same cost to drive posts in this fence as it is any of the others. But it's so critical to hit those posts on eight foot that in reality, the labor cost is going to be higher because the time is going to be more. And if we hit rock, the time is going to be significantly more. So. Um, we're still at almost $7 a foot with this type of fencing. Uh, and that's a pretty inexpensive builder because I'm pretty cheap in my calculations. Uh, certainly not what you'd pay someone else to build that fence. Uh, woven wire. This is the traditional fence we see on a lot of perimeters on properties. The benefit of a woven wire and similarly a fixed knot high tensile is that the woven wire is much more forgiving to poor maintenance. So if people are putting in a fence and they're not going to keep it weed eated, they're not going to spray it, and they're going to end up with rose bushes, other things growing up in their fence. Uh, woven wire is a lot more forgiving to that type of management, um, and it stays upright, which is uh, positive. Woven wire fence, though, traditional woven wire doesn't have any vertical support in it. So it inherently wants to fall down, it tries to sag. It has about a 10% stretch in it. Um, the material, because it's lower carbon steel than the high tensile wire we're going to talk about in the next three, um, it needs vertical posts every 12 foot. It's really critical we have a post every 12 foot or so to make sure that that fence sits upright the way it needs to. Uh, and because of that, uh, both the woven wire itself and all those posts, our material costs are almost $3 a foot. Uh, with a labor cost of around $1.50 a foot. So we're coming in over $4, four dollars four fifty a foot for traditional woven wire, uh, which is not an inexpensive fence to put up by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but a lot of people are very familiar with building this type of fence. The fixed knot high tensile looks very similar to a standard woven wire fence, but it's a high tensile steel. And what that means is that the carbon ratio in it is a little bit different. That makes that fence stronger, uh, less likely to stretch. Uh, and the vertical stays in this fence are continuous strands of wire, which helps this fence stand up on its own. It still needs some posts in the line to keep everything square to where it needs to be. But we can be much more forgiving in where we place these posts. So these posts can easily stretch out to 20 to 25 feet on flat ground, 15 to 20 feet on ground that has a little more undulation to it. Um, and we can stretch a longer distance with this type of wire because that stretchability on that fence is less. It only takes about 1% where the other woven wire would be 10% stretch. So this fixed knot high tensile fence ends up being a less expensive option than standard woven wire for a couple reasons. We have a less post in this design. We have a post every 20 foot or so. Um, that means our labor is also less because we drive less posts in the ground and we steeple in less places. Um, similarly, um, 
the actual woven wire, the fabric of it is uh, a little bit lighter than the standard woven wire that we would traditionally use. Um, and so a lot of times we actually come out a little bit cheaper on the fabric of the fence as well, which is kind of interesting. A lot of people don't expect that. It used to be the opposite, that the high tensile steel wire was a little more expensive, but with steel prices that kind of went crazy between 2020 and 2022, it shifted so that this material is now a little bit cheaper than most of the woven wire that people purchase. Um, for high tensile wire, this is a smooth high tensile wire. Um, these come in rolls. Um, they're pretty easy, you can see here, to unroll. Um, the benefit of this type of material is um, that it is very cheap to put up uh, because we don't have a lot of material in the fence. The key, though, on it is that we absolutely need good bracing and we need it to be hot. Otherwise, it is a fence that animals can walk straight through. Um, so um, I know some people will put up 8 or 10 or 14 wires and try and not electrify them. There's no reason to build this fence and not do an electrification on it. This fence makes complete sense once it's electrified. And so I'm going to work off the assumption that we're doing a five-strand, high-tensile electrified fence. Uh, the benefit on this fence is that I can keep my posts stretched out nice and far. 25 feet is very reasonable on this fence, maybe even 30 feet if I've got flat ground. Um, NRCS has some different specifications on it right now, but, but if you were building it at your cost, I think that would be a very appropriate spacing on posts. Um, the other thing is because I don't have to have all those wires nailed at every one of those posts, even my labor costs, my posts and my, my attachment is a little bit faster here. So I end up with just over $2 a foot in this type of fencing. Um, keep in mind that that wire is four, five, six cents a foot. It's, it's pretty inexpensive. So by the time I do five wires, I'm still just talking cents per foot of fence in terms of that fabric. That's really what keeps this fence inexpensive. Uh, and last but not least is barbed wire. This is sort of that standard fence that a lot of people will assume is the least cost on a, on a permanent fencing design. The barbed wire similar to um, the high tensile wire has uh, smooth the high tensile wire has moved to high tensile steels, um, meaning that the bracing on it is more important than it used to be. Uh, the stretch on it is less than older barbed wire, which is nice. Uh, but there are two challenges with barbed wire. One, barbed wire does not get electrified. I should repeat that again. Barbed wire does not get electrified. It's not a good idea. It's not safe. Uh, it's not a recommendation that anyone, uh, at least I've never seen an engineer actually make that recommendation. Uh, I hope not. Um, and so as a result, we need to have more posts. Um, because the high tensile fence, the reason animals don't go through it and we can space our posts out is because they can't push between two electrified wires and not get shocked. With the barbed wire, they have the ability to push between if we don't keep our post spacing a little bit tighter. So I've gone with 12 foot post spacing on my barbed wire here. Um, and that just means there's more posts in the ground. Uh, similarly, barbed wire has gone up in price significantly more than smooth wire, which is kind of interesting to see. Um, and so you can see here that the price on this fence is about two and a half dollars a foot, um, which is very similar to the price that we saw on the fixed knot high tensile fence, which is kind of interesting. They're usually cost comparable when you actually look at these two because of the extra posts uh, that we usually will design for in a barbed wire fence. Um, the costs on the posts themselves, I've assumed in all of that that I'm using a treated wood post. There are lots of other materials that are out there on the market that are appropriate at different times and places. Uh, but I said before, I'm building a lifespan fence. That's one of my priorities when I build a fence. So I'm probably going to step away from any untreated wood uh, unless I have, say, a organic operation or something where I might need to consider that. I'm going to lean towards treated wood if I can. Uh, steel T-posts are not a terrible option in a number of these fences in a line post. Certainly not an appropriate post for a brace or a corner. Um, uh, but they might be something you could do to reduce cost in a fence line. Um, alternating a wood and a steel, something like that might be a cost saving that you would consider. Uh, and for the electrification, uh, steel posts are basically a grounding system on that, so that's not ideal. For them, you might be looking at something like a fiberglass post as something to put in the line uh, as an alternative to a wood post. 
although some of those fiberglass posts that are on the market right now are cost comparable to uh, the wood posts that are out there. So it's a little bit of a decision about what's gonna work on your operation. Um, on top of that fencing that we just talked about, that permanent fencing, the fence planning before we start doing our interior fencing is really important. A lot of people will instinctively want to build a farm so that everything is the same size. They will try and cut a farm. If it's a big square, they'll make it into littler squares. Um, but it's really important before we start laying out those interior fences that we consider if we do need a variety of sizes. So on my operation, I have bulls. And they're only in for 60 days because I only want to check for calves for 60 days at a time. It's the only length of time I can handle mentally. Um, and so what I would prefer is that I have a couple small fields for bulls. Uh, if I have a cow that I have to get up and hold up, I want to have a small pen. If I'm weaning my calves, I might not need the same size pen for those calves that I'm weaning. If I'm CPH, I've got 45 days. I need to hold them somewhere. I might need a couple different pastures than the ones um, that I would standardly rotate my cows through. Um, and so each operation is a little bit different. Uh, plus, I just showed you my pictures of my alpaca. They definitely don't go in with my cows. They have a different set of pastures, and they're much smaller than my, my pens for my cows. So everyone's going to have a little bit different decision making on their farm. Um, but you certainly want to evaluate, do you need all the same size pastures, or are you looking for different size pastures? Um, and one of the ways we do that is to create that permanent fencing on the exterior of large areas and then use some temporary fencing on the interior to make smaller areas uh, to make some of that practical. Um, those smaller areas, you can have a little bit of forgiveness if an animal breaks through into the next area. It's not necessarily going to destroy the operation as long as we've got good permanent fencing to keep them out of, say, a hay field that's high value or a crop field. Um, we can use some permanent fencing in some spots and then use some temporary fencing in other spots to keep costs down. Uh, the temporary posts vary in cost quite a bit, but they also vary in design quite a bit. Um, and so one thing I just want to encourage people to think about is if you're doing small ruminants or something other than full-size mama cows, you can use things other than the pigtails that are out there that are very commonly used uh, to manage a different t size animal. Um, some of these step-in posts um, that allow for different heights are really valuable uh, for operations that are doing something other than a, a cow-calf um, that they're trying to hold in 1,200-pound cows. Uh, and I will say that, in general, there's a wide variety of costs on step-in posts. Um, but typically, you, you get what you pay for with temporary posts. Uh, the quality of the materials makes a big difference in the lifespan of them. Um, and so sometimes paying more up front hurts, uh, but it can be justified if you're going to get five or six years as opposed to one or two years out of a very inexpensive post. The UV stabilization on some of these is quite poor, and other ones it's quite good. Um, and so that's something you do have to keep in mind if you're using temporary posts. Similarly, there's a lot of different materials out there in terms of wire um, that you can put into these temporary fences. The poly tapes and the poly ropes um, are much heavier to build with. Um, you need posts more often, but they have much better visibility. So if you're training animals on these fences and they're not familiar with temporary fencing, it's a really good strategy to introduce them to that fencing. Uh, the negatives on them is that they're a little bit less portable. It's harder to roll them up sometimes, um, so it might not be what you would choose to use on your whole operation. Uh, and overall, there are a lot of different types of portable wire, ribbon, tape, rope. The thing you're looking for is one that has good conductivity, low ohms. Um, the more resistance it has to electricity, the bigger the box, the less you're going to be able to run that fence, the less shock there's going to be for an animal on that temporary system. So some of like the turbo wires and things like that that have much better conductivity have a real value if we're doing a lot of temporary fencing um, in order to get enough charge on that small wire, those small pieces of metal, uh, to really get a good shock on the animals. Um, and from a cost perspective with the energizers, we want to size an energizer to make sure it'll handle all of the wire we're doing. Um, a lot of people instinctively go to solar boxes because it's easy to move them around. The challenge is that a solar or a battery-operated 
um, energizer or charger is significantly more expensive than one that plugs in an AC powered unit. If you have AC power, if you have a 120 plug on your farm, you are far better off to choose a box that plugs in uh, because bang for buck, it's going to be the cheapest. Plus that solar panel and that battery are both gonna have a limited lifespan where that AC unit will probably last a little bit longer. So both from a durability and a cost per unit of power it puts out, um, there's a real value in a plug-in box if you have that there. However, if you have leased land or something where you don't have power on it, a solar box is a really nice option for getting power there very quickly. Um, and keep in mind that that poly wire, all that internal stuff that we're talking about for temporary, and I think this is generous, it's only gonna give you half the distance that you would get if you were running 12 and a half gauge high tensile steel wire. So if you think you were running your high tensile steel wire around a huge farm, and you're gonna move to some sort of interior temporary fencing, don't think you can run the same amount of wire with that poly wire that you were running on that 12 and a half gauge wire on a different farm. Because they don't run the same way. They don't carry power the same way. Um, the other thing that I know you guys have been looking at is the watering systems. And I just throw these numbers out here. I, I use these numbers in the fall and I don't think they've shifted too much. You know, black water line, about 65 cents a foot. Um, high float flow, float valves, 50, 75 bucks. Quick couplers, 15-ish dollars. Compression T couplers, 15-ish dollars. Ball valves, 10 to 20 dollars. There are costs associated with it, but I will say as compared to permanent water systems, they are less expensive. A lot more labor involved in temporary watering systems. Um, so it, it is a, it's a decision, but you know, we're talking about two inch PVC pipe. We can push a lot more water through a two inch PVC pipe than we could. However, there's a cost associated with it. And 220 a foot I think is a, a good price right now for PVC. I think we'd be struggling to find that right now. PVC couplers, two, four dollars, depending on the size and, and what type of coupler. The T's, at least five dollars. I just bought some the other day that were a little bit more than that. Uh, some PEX pipe depending on the size, anywhere from 60 cents up to almost a dollar a foot. Um, and a commercial tank has a pretty significant cost associated with it as well. Um, the benefit is if you put in a permanent watering system, you can put in a heavy use area around it and have sort of a controlled area where you water. Um, the challenge is you have a permanent watering system and that also controls where your fencing goes, doesn't it? So it is a consideration, um, some people that is a deal breaker, they don't want that water permanent, other people would much prefer permanent water, um, and so each person has to make their own decisions. Um, but both are out there, both are options on the table. Um, I said before I'm in inherently biased towards electrified fencing, and the one thing I will say is I'm a big believer in using electricity on my permanent fencing on my perimeters instead of putting a barbed wire strand on the top. Uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, the electric wire does the same thing as the barbed wire that we traditionally see on the top of a woven wire fence. It keeps animals from rubbing and pushing on that fence. Um, and if I'm putting in a new fence, I want the animals to not rub and push on it because I want it to last long enough that I'm not gonna have to rebuild it. Um, but it also allows me a supply of hot anywhere in the pasture, which is really useful for putting in a temporary fencing system. Uh, it allows me to have one grounding system. It allows me to have one plug-in spot that runs my whole operation. I can buy one large box instead of trying to manage a couple small solar boxes that I keep having to check battery and turn them off and recharge them and figure out what's happening. So there's a lot of benefits in having that hotline anywhere in the pasture so I can break up the field however I want it. It makes the whole system operate a little bit more smoothly. Uh, and with that, I will take any questions. I would definitely, if, if I'm using an offset that's basically tied to the barbed wire and it's got a little bit of flex in it, I would run it on that side. If I'm running it on the other side, I would at the very least want to run power 
across the fence through the barbed wire to another spot and get it tied off tight so I didn't, wasn't pulling it and gonna catch the barbed wire and ground myself out on my barbed wire fence. Um, ideally, I put one on both sides because that makes it easier, but then I have, I have enough area there that it, as long as it's high enough that they can still graze the ground underneath, I'd be happy. If I thought that the hot wires were causing them not to clean up underneath the fence, then I might reevaluate how I was running that across. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I would prefer one on both sides as long as they're cleaning up the ground underneath it, though. I would agree with you, Chris. I just don't want to weed eat the fence line, so if I can make them eat it, I'd prefer that. There is in your, in your uh, book, there's a publication that Morgan and Jeremy and I wrote on using offset for grazing spaces. It's underneath the electric fence we have. And there's some really, we, we have pictures of the 12 inch offsets that attach directly to barbed wire or to woven wire uh, and just hook on. And they're really nice in the sense that if the fence is soft and a little bit wiggly, It'll move with the fence, which is really nice. Yeah. How many of your five lines are on a high fence gate? Uh, I would do all five for most animals. I say my alpacas, I have an alternating hot ground system because for small ruminants, that's more appropriate in my opinion. Um, but for cattle, all five wires hot, all five wires tied at both ends. Um, so Jeremy isn't going to talk at all about electric in here. Is Okay, it, the importance then is that you get parallel if we, if we tie both ends together and we get really low resistance on it. So we can run huge distances if we have all five wires hot at, and tied at both ends. It's really a huge benefit. We, and we do have an electric fencing school in June. In Somerset. Yeah, I'll be there, don't worry. It's closer to home for me. Did you have a question? Uh, new installations of farmer stands. How important is it to be uh, on the close to the property line? Uh, an example, you know, you have a wood uh, leaching out into your, your fields and what have you. So how important is it to have your perimeter fence on your property line? Um, it's critical to have it on the property line. If you're gonna run a fence and it's not gonna be on the property line, you wanna establish with your neighbor that they understand that you're not giving them that land. If, if that other fence disappears, if there's no fence on the original property line and they start running cattle on it, over time they can take advantage of your land. So I'm not opposed to fencing out a treed area, but you don't wanna lose it. Um, so, there's, there's adverse possession, so you need to come to the fencing school and listen to the fencing lawyer. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, if they maintain that side of the fence, you put a fence on 20 feet off your property line, they maintain it for so many years, then they and can I think it's 15. Um, if, there's, if there's an existing fence on the property line, and you don't want to take the trees down, you can always put an interior fence up to keep them out of the trees but you don't want to lose the original fence and have them start using your land and not, you don't want to lose, you know, acres. That's not a good idea. <laughs> not a good business proposition. So I would, I would lean towards it. And, and you do have, if, if you get into arguments, you do have the ability to clear the property line, eight foot on both sides of it, if it ends up in, in legal dispute, which is not where you want to end up. But if, if it gets pushed through the court system to put a fence on a property line, you can clear the fence line. Like, they, they will force it if, if it comes to that a lot of times. But you won't have a good neighbor. But you won't have a very good neighbor. But, so you may end up having to put it in amongst the trees. If I was putting in a fence amongst trees, I would always put in high tensile wire because it doesn't have the stretch, so it's not going to fail when the limb falls on it. It's gonna come, we're gonna take the limb off, it's gonna come back up, we'll be able to pull it back up. So that high tensile wire is really critical. Morgan, will you be here through lunch? Yes, I will be here through lunch. Okay, so more questions for Morgan, get her at lunch. Let's give her a hand.